Good morning. I'm Jonathan K. Part opinion writer for The Washington Post. Welcome to First Look, Washington Post Live's one-stop shop for news and analysis. And you know it's a good morning when Washington Post's chief political correspondent Dan Baltz is here. Dan, good morning. Good morning, Jonathan. All right. So uh, yesterday we saw something we haven't seen. Well, I don't remember ever seeing this. The president of the United States and a bipartisan group of senators going to the microphones outside the West Wing uh, to announce a compromise plan on infrastructure. Uh, what's in this plan, Dan? And why is this such a big deal? Well, it's a big deal for two reasons. One is it's a big deal because they got an agreement. They got an agreement across party lines. As, as you say, we haven't seen this kind of thing in Washington for a long time, particularly on something that is, that is this costly, although infrastructure has long been something on which Republicans and Democrats said they could agree, um, but for a long time they haven't been able to. So it's a big deal in that way. Um, it amounts to about a trillion and, and change uh, in spending over eight years. Uh, for what we would think of as hard infrastructure, roads, bridges, transit, um, a variety of, of things that the country certainly needs by all indications, um, and that this will, you know, this will improve the hard infrastructure of the country. Um, it took a lot of negotiations among the, the bipartisan group of senators, um, along with the White House, to try to tease out this agreement. Um, there are obviously questions ahead. We'll talk about those. Um, but it's a big deal, and, and Biden rightly can claim at this point uh, a victory for the bipartisanship that he said he was determined uh, to try to show could work in Washington today. So, Dan, can you talk about what then emerged as this one, this one step, two step? So the one step being the bipartisan, the bipartisan deal the president announced uh, with the senators yesterday. But then the second step being the reconciliation bill, which would have all the other stuff that the president wants, the um, human infrastructure, as he's calling it, which, is, which also happens to be a lot of the prog progressive priorities. And you have both the president and the speaker of the house saying that you can't pass one without the other. Is that going to blow apart this bipartisan deal? And is that enough to keep all of the cats herded that um, the president needs herded to get both those things passed? Well, I think that metaphor is exactly right. I mean, this 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 herding of cats that's going to have to take place between now and uh, the ultimate outcome of this. Um, it seemed like it was very difficult to get to a bipartisan agreement, and it, and it was. Uh, but now getting both the bipartisan agreement on the infrastructure package and the reconciliation package that will be substantially higher uh, and substantially more controversial in a partisan way, uh, getting both of those enacted in the House and the Senate will be a real struggle and it will be a, you know, a, a mighty test of the Biden administration's ability uh, to keep the, the centrists in their own party uh, happy, to keep Republicans on board on the infrastructure package and to keep the uh, the progressive wing of the party satisfied that the reconciliation package is big enough. Um, you heard immediately uh, more than grumbling from Republicans, including Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who basically was condemning Biden for saying he would not sign the uh, infrastructure bill unless he also gets the reconciliation package. But uh, Speaker Pelosi had said the same thing earlier in the day. Um, using very blunt language that there would not be the infrastructure package without the reconciliation package. I think that now becomes the big challenge. Um, there are some Republicans, Senator Bill Cassidy indicated that he thought it would be terrible politics for the Democrats to say, well, if we can't get the reconciliation package through, we're not going to pass the infrastructure package. And he thought that that would play badly politically. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of hard work left to do to try to steer both of these trains along the tracks that they're now on. Um, Dan, I have to correct you. The Speaker of the House did not say there would be no. She, <laughs> she said, quote, there ain't going to be no deal <laughs> without reconciliation. And she said I, it I not once, to, but twice. I take my road grammatically, Jonathan, but, uh, but yes, you're literally correct. That's what she said. There ain't <laughs> going to be no. <laughs> I mean, when she said it, my neck whipped back. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
Speaker Speaker Pelosi means business here. So Dan, um, let's talk more about the complexity here because I'm just wondering who are the Republicans aside from the ones who were there with him yesterday um, outside the West Wing? But who are the Republicans President Biden can do business with? And then actually, you know what? Leave that off. Let's focus on the Democrats. Who are the Democrats, if you know, who he has to worry about in terms of getting all of these things over the finish line? Well, I mean, he's going to have to certainly worry about uh, Bernie Sanders, who's the chair of the Budget Committee and who's drafting uh, the big reconciliation package and has talked about it in terms of six trillion dollars. Um, I don't know whether that's what we're going to end up with in terms of what comes to the floor of the Senate. Um, but the first thing is that they're going to have to work with uh, Bernie Sanders to try to get something that's mutually acceptable to, to the president and, and to, to Senator Sanders. Um, and, and Sanders, you know, symbolically speaks for the, the progressive wing of the party. Uh, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez yesterday was, was attacking the bipartisan deal. Um, in part because she said that the negotiators did not reflect the true diversity of the country and therefore the, the priorities uh, of the country as a whole. Um, so there will be liberals in the House and, and the Senate, particularly in the House, who could, who could deep six uh, parts of this package. Um, but he's also, uh, the president's also going to have to make sure that the, that the moderates stay in line, that, that, you know, that Joe Manchin uh, and Kirsten Sinema are prepared to go along with the size of the reconciliation package uh, that now seems to be in the offing. So um, he's got work to do at both ends of the of the political spectrum, just within his own party. Um, and we'll, you know, again, we'll see uh, whether they're up to it. I, I think one of the things we've we've been able to see is that the president does have a certain amount of patience. Uh, to try to work out a the, the bipartisan agreement, um, but also a sense of timing. I talked to a Democrat uh, a week or ten days ago who basically said it, it is in the president's interest to basically say what's on uh, on the bipartisan deal. And this was before it had it had finally kind of hatched. Said basically he just needs to take that deal right away because there's. The, the rest of this is going to take time and they don't necessarily have unlimited time to get the reconciliation piece of this done. So um, so the president was, I think, smart to do what he did uh, in taking this deal now. Um, but it but it it certainly leaves a lot of unanswered questions. And and some of the details of the, the bipartisan package are certainly going to be, you know, under <laughs> under scrutiny, to put it mildly. Right, right. And let's talk about the, in the talk about time in the uh, less than three minutes that we have left, maybe less than two minutes that we have left. Can we talk about voting rights? Um, the, the For the People Act um, failed on Tuesday. And um, after the measure failed, Vice President Harris uh, said to the press, quote, the fight is not over. OK, so does the White House have a plan going forward? Uh, I think this is a longer term plan that the White House has to has to deal with. There's no immediate prospect, given what happened in the Senate uh, the other day, uh, that the For the People Act has got a has got any kind of a viable path uh, to 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 be enacted. And and we've known that for a long time that uh, absent a change in the filibuster, um, there's no way that that can be done. Um, the second piece of voting rights is the John Lewis Act. Um, but um, as Democrats have indicated, this will be several months before that bill is ready to come to you know a debate on the Senate or the House floor. There's work that has to be done on that front. So I think that we're at a point now where Democrats, and particularly the president and the vice president, the vice president who's you know who has this as part of her portfolio, um, will be mostly doing rhetorical work on this front to keep the issue. Uh, in the forefront of the discussion, um, but they don't have much they can do practically to try to advance the, the ideas and the proposals that they have on the table. Some of this will still have to do with whether over a period of time, Senator Manchin has some you know, change of position or change of heart uh, on, the, on the filibuster. But so far, there's no indication that he's prepared to do anything that would provide even a carve out uh, to do the uh, the For the People Act on a straight uh, straight majority mm -hmm. vote. 
Yeah, and on the, the, the issue of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, um, to just uh, amplify what you were just talking about, um, yes, this is going to take months and months and months. There, it hasn't even been introduced in the House. There's still um, legislation. They're still doing hearings. And then after the hearings in the House, they then have to go out and do, um, I, can't, uh, um, uh, I think it's called off-site hearings, meaning outside of Washington and various places around the country before they can even get to the point of producing legislation for the House to even vote on. So we're looking at months before the John Lewis Voting Rights Act um, comes John, up for any aspects, kind of debate. One of, the aspects, one of the aspects that they're dealing with on that is that it not only has to you know, find the necessary votes to get through Congress, it's going to have to uh, pass constitutional muster. In one way or another, right. they're going to have to have a bill that persuades the Chief Justice uh, that what they did when they when they repealed Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act in 2013, I believe it was, um, that that this is still necessary, that the preclearance is still necessary. So that's part of the case that they have to build, and that's why they're taking their time. Right. That, and that there, Dan, is the key, the key part. They are trying to dot all the I's and cross all the T's on constitutionality to ensure that whatever they come up with can um, withstand constitutional muster. Dan Baltz, uh, as always, thanks for coming to First Look. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Jonathan. You too. All right, let's go to the opinion side of the Washington Post, where we will find deputy editorial page editor Ruth Marcus and columnist George Will. Welcome both. Welcome back to First Look. Glad to be with you. Morning. All right, so the big news is this infrastructure compromise deal slash plan. Um, George, I'll have you go first. Um, does this mean that bipartisanship is back? Well, that would be premature, but it does mean what is over is the never true supposition that nothing gets done in Washington. Remember under the Obama administration, which supposedly was defeated by gridlock, we passed the largest financial uh, services reform since the 1930s with Dodd-Frank. We passed the largest expansion of the welfare state since 1965 with the Affordable Care Act. So the, the government hasn't been quite as impotent as, as it is said to have been. This does demonstrate that there are a lot of issues that are eminently splittable differences. How much do you want to spend on this and that? And this is a, a realm of splittable differences. We're not talking about capital punishment, prayer in schools, uh, all the, the abortion, the, the hot button issues of the culture wars. This is money. The fact is that every state, probably every congressional district has a construction company and construction workers. This is, this is made for cooperation. Ruth, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Bipartisan back? Bipartisanship is back? Well, bipartisanship is um, off of life support and breathing on its own. We'll see for how long. Uh, I do agree with George that government can function, but government uh, has shown itself, uh, and I think George agrees with this, over the last um, few decades to do best when it is spending money and adding to the deficit and pretending not to add to the deficit with some magic pay-fors. Uh, you talked about hurting cats though, Jonathan. I'm gonna switch metaphors on you and maybe mix some. I think that right now, the president is like a ballet dancer on a tightrope. He really needs to uh, execute this very complicated maneuver of sort of simultaneously passing the, the uh, infrastructure bill that was agreed on, agreed on yesterday by enough folks um, and of getting the reconciliation piece of this through. And he's mediating between th really three sets of groups, uh, Republicans who may fall off, some of whom may fall off on enough of them. The infrastructure package, we heard from Senator Graham, who said he was not happy about the reconciliation bill. Uh, uh, moderates in his own party who might not be happy with what's in the reconciliation bill and progressives in his own party who think none of who may think none of it is enough. This is, uh, if he can pull this off, um, I, I do have this vision of Joe Biden in a tutu. Um, it will be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to add to your metaphor. I think he's a ballet dancer on a tightrope uh, in the fog at night, just to add to the, the difficulty. <laughs> um, 
I, I was just I was just to stick uh, um, on this issue for one more one more uh, question, and that is, the president came out of the West Wing with the senators, like he would probably like he probably did when he was a member of the Senate, having met with the president, going out to the microphones uh, outside the West Wing to tell the press about what happened. Um, it was sort of like sort of like the old days. It, I mean. What do you? What did you make of that? Because I've never seen a president do that. George, George, you go first, and then I'll ask Ruth another question about something else. Well, I suppose it does seem to compromise the vision of the imperial, not to say regal, presidency, that uh, he should actually understand that he's dealing with people of a co-equal branch of government. Indeed, he's dealing with people who are in Article One of the Constitution. He's mm -hmm. in Article Two. Uh, the legislative branch is first and primary for good reasons. Uh, they start things, they initiate, they pass laws that it is his job to, to see that they are faithfully executed. That's about, that's the, the heart of what Article 2 says about the presidency. So I thought it was a good sign that uh, the sort of Madisonian uh, architecture of the government was visible there on the uh, White House driveway. Mm -hmm. Um, R Ruth, so you've been writing about the Supreme Court a lot lately, and that's because it, the, the, the term is winding down. And you were impressed with how Justice Amy Coney Barrett came down on both the Obamacare ruling and the Philadelphia foster care case. Why? Uh, because I, uh, and George has been writing a lot about the Supreme Court as well, so I'll really be interested in what he has to say. I have been and continue to be very um, worried about Justice Barrett's ascension to the court. She has a, um, a conservative view that I'm not going to agree with um, in most of the cases she decides. And in particular, she's very willing to overturn precedents that, she, uh, that are based on the Constitution that she disagrees with. However, I thought both in the Affordable Care Act case, where she not only voted with the majority to say that the challengers, the latest challengers to the ACA didn't have standing, but didn't sign on to either the dissent or the concurrence by Justice Thomas, who said, okay, Justice Thomas said, okay, they don't have standing, but this law is really a constitutional mess and it should have been, if they had standing, I'd get rid of it. Um, and then similarly in the Philadelphia foster care case, she was with the majority, didn't uh, wrote a concurrence where she talked about getting rid of a ruling that I actually think should be gotten rid of on religious freedom. It was written by Justice Scalia, who she clerked for, um, but she didn't go so far as the um, concurrer, other concurrers who wanted to say, let's get rid of this ruling right now, go away. So this may be a temporary, um, period of restraint for her in her first term. One could imagine the Chief Justice whispering in her ear, you're going to be here for 30 years. Um, you don't have it all done at once. Nonetheless, very welcome restraint from her. Uh, your view, George. Well, I agree. I think uh, she is cognizant of, and the court, all the justices become cognizant of once they sit on the court, of what are called reliance interests. Uh, just to take the example of the Affordable Care Act, it's been around now for 11 years, and people have adjusted in their th thinking about it, but also institutions and hospitals and all kinds of social service organizations have adjusted to its fact, and therefore to overturn it would have been a, a remarkably disruptive act, and the court doesn't like to be disruptive. Uh, she seems to adhere to the view, which is, I, I think, normal and good, which is don't go places constitutionally or in construing laws that you don't have to go, that you're not compelled to go by the case in front of you. In that sense, I think she showed herself to be moderately restrained, uh, but we're going to have to wait and see. I mean, we, the big test we all know is coming up, uh, and that is the Mississippi case on, on abortion that challenges or could be said to challenge. Uh, the heart of Roe v. Wade from 1973. So let's wait just a little bit till we draw firm conclusions. George, let me stick with you here. His presidents and inter interest groups regularly are surprised or disappointed by how, just how justices they fought for actually wind up ruling 
from the bench. How would you describe how the three Trump appointees, Gorsuch, Barrett, and Kavanaugh, are doing in that regard? Well, first, they're different. They're, they're not, that's not a homogenous trio there. Uh, they're, you don't get to the Supreme Court without having strong views and a firmly developed philosophy. Second, this is an old phenomenon. Franklin Roosevelt appointed uh, Felix Frankfurter and was disappointed in uh, many of Frankfurter's rulings, and he's not the first. Truman was indignant uh, that some of what he liked to call his justices didn't support him in the steel seizure case in, what was it, Ruth, 1950, 51, I guess. Uh, so. Uh, that, that this also is a sign of health, that the, the ju Justice, Chief Justice Roberts liked to say there are no Obama judges, no Trump judges, we're just judges. And I think, uh, in fact, that's more descriptive than, than the political labels applied. Hmm. Um, Go ahead, Ruth. Dissent, I, 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 <laughs> dissent, I think, is what the justices say when they're not completely losing patience with each other. It, I think this has been a term of surprising unanimity on a not closely divided court. It's a 6-3 conservative court and a term of um, some significant restraint on the part of the justices. But we will be seeing more opinions um, today and possibly next week as well. Uh, yes. And I think that uh, there's two really important things to say. One is that a court where Justice Kavanaugh is the swing justice is a very, very conservative court. It's just degrees of conservatism. There are three justices, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, who are way to the right in most situations. And there are three justices for now have been more towards what passes for the middle. But this is middle only in the sense that the others are further to the right. This is a very conservative court. Which leads me to the second point, which is George mentioned the abortion case that's coming up next term. That's only a piece of what's coming up next term. We have a significant abortion case. We have a, the first gun case in years from the court that will, I think, further um, entrench gun rights and um, prioritize the Second Amendment over the ability of states and the federal government to pass reasonable gun regulation. And we are likely to have an affirmative action case uh, from Harvard that could signal the real um, death of affirmative action in higher education. So watch that space and let's not get too excited about a few restrained votes, though I was excited about them um, from <laughs> Justice. Jonathan, could I dissent from her dissent? Just briefly. <laughs> sure. The, the Harvard case that, that's coming up, I don't think what the Supreme Court says about affirmative action in college admissions makes a particle of difference to the behavior of admissions departments, because what they will do is they will say, fine, we're not going to have quotas. We're not going to have affirmative action. We're going to have a holistic review of applicants. And under that, that rubric, which is spectacularly vague, uh, they can do anything they want and will do. I'm going to uh, concur. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. The, the ping pong match is over. But Ruth, I want you to go back into your crystal ball um, because you were talking, you were forecasting cases are going to come up next term. But there's still major cases we haven't heard about from this term. And I'm, I'm most interested um, in the one on voting rights. What do you, what's, what's, what are the tea leaves saying to you? Well, this is involving section two of the Voting Rights Act. Um, we saw the court, and this is what you were talking about earlier with Dan in terms of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. We saw the court uh, effectively eviscerate section five, which is the pre-clearance sections of the Voting Rights Act. This is a case out of Arizona that involves section two, which is once a state, it's not pre-clearance, but once a state passes a, a voting restriction, uh, can it be challenged afterwards? In what situations can it be challenged? And Section 2 has been used mostly in terms of how to draw districts and whether they're fair and not necessarily in terms of the kinds of um, uh, restrictions that are at issue here, which involve um, so-called ballot harvesting, where people um, collect ballots and bring them to voting places um, and out of precinct voting and whether that should be counted. And it's and it is another opportunity um, for the court if it chooses to 
narrow or constrain the reach of the Voting Rights Act. So I'm very much watching that. And I'm also very much watching a case that I'm sure George is interested in as well from California it involves um, whether charities have to disclose to California authorities supposedly in secret the identities of their donors. The significance of this has to do with what it will augur for um, the ability of the federal government and states to compel disclosure in the campaign finance context, which has been a tenet of both conservative and liberal jurisprudence previously, which I think is essential sunlight um, and which could also, uh, just as Thomas has been arguing this, um, be up for some re-examination. George, I want to get you to comment on something um, something else California related, uh, but we only have about five, about four, four minutes left. And, and that is, last night at the Reagan Library, former Vice President Mike Pence said, quote, there's almost no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. The presidency belongs to the American people and the American people alone. He's putting even more daylight between himself and Donald Trump than he did the last time he spoke out on this issue. What's going on here? Well, don't try to read fine print through that daylight because it's very narrow. You could not still slip a tissue between Trump and, and Pence because what Pence said was, it will be a while before Mr. Trump and I see eye to eye on the riot and the sacking of, of, uh, of the Capitol. That's not someone who's breaking with Donald Trump in any meaningful sense. The Reagan Library is having a series of talks from leading Republicans. The first was by Paul Ryan, the second by Mr. Pence, about the future of the Republican Party. Uh, so we're going to hear more. Nikki Haley will be out there and some others, uh, Tom Cotton and, and, and others. This is the earliest cattle call, if you will, of the 2024 uh, nominee selection process. Um, and, and so, I mean, you raise a good a good point there, George, in that the the distance in the daylight, you could stick a piece of tissue paper in there. And so, Ruth, the question is then, by should we read into that, despite Ron DeSantis winning that straw poll um, over the la last weekend at a conservative gathering, um, that the the hold that Donald Trump has on the Republican Party um, is still firm. Firm and toxic. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. It's firm and it's toxic. And the notion that uh, Mike Pence, after everything that has happened, um, simply reaffirms the correctness of what he did, and that's viewed as somehow bravery uh, or distancing himself from Donald Trump, when the reality is, is that he got up at the Reagan Library and compared Donald Trump to Ronald Reagan. Um, I was not a huge fan of the Reagan presidency, but I'm curious about whether George, and I know how he feels, um, sees Donald Trump as Reagan-esque in any way. Come on. In no way at all. And not, I mean, Reagan was, above all things, a cheerful, happy warrior. He was someone who, uh, who said, I I'm a former Democrat. Democrats are, are, are subject to salvation and redemption. Uh, he, he just brought a vocabulary of, of conciliation and happiness that uh, Donald Trump is, is missing. Uh, that's enough to be said about that, I think. So then, the uh, rule of law, you know, that uh, I would take Ronald Reagan over Donald Trump any day of the week. I would take any Republican no, president. Trump's hold on the Republican Party is at this moment firm, but it is as brittle as Limoges, China. And one of the things that can break it is time, the sheer passage of time. The president's going to go out and hold some rallies. And I think you're going to find that people, that he looks very much like yesterday's news. Uh, never mind what might come out of the prosecutors in New York about his past business practices. The sheer passage of time is going to uh, tarnish and ultimately uh, reduce the man to, I think, very limited relevance. Um, I mean, we don't have any time, but I have to ask this because your reference to time there, George, I keep thinking, I don't know if our democracy has that, has that much time. Um, because even though he is yesterday's news, the people who are still in office, 
who have to vote for things, or in this case with Republicans, not vote for things, are still in power. So can the republic survive um, that passage of time? The Republic survived a civil war. Indeed, it conducted off-year elections and a presidential election during the civil war. The president, this current president, Mr. Biden, in his inaugural address referred to our fragile democracy. I don't read American history as an essay on fragility. Ruth, I'll give you the last word. I'm with George. I, well, our, I, I, yeah. I think we are extremely, an extremely resilient democracy and we will survive Trump, and I hope sooner rather than later. Um, I, well, I hope you are both right. I'm usually Mr. M Mr. Optimism, but I, on this question, I don't, I, I don't know. Ruth Marcus, <coughs> excuse me, George Will, uh, thank you very much. We are way out of time. Thank you very much for coming back to First Look. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks for having us. Thanks. And Thanks. as all. And as always, thank you for tuning in and putting up with my sneezing and my, my allergies, my apologies. Please come back at 11 a.m. Eastern uh, when my colleague Mike Duffy interviews Colorado Congressman Ken Buck about his efforts to rein in the power of tech giants in Silicon Valley. You can always head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and find more information about upcoming programs. Then join me tonight for Brooks and Capehart on the PBS NewsHour. Check your local listings. And then join me on Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern for the Sunday show on MSNBC. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Thank you for tuning in to First Look on Washington Post Live.